business development for uh, NeuroCatch. So thank you all for joining us. Again, apologies for the, the slight delay, but it just gave a few more minutes for everyone to get online. So the webinar today is integrating neurotechnologies into clinical rehab practice. So we invited three uh, clinical leaders to join us today, and I'm going to do their introductions right now. We'll start with the agenda. So the agenda, I'm going to introduce the speakers. Then we're going to talk about the clinic that they work at, and that's the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. Then we're going to briefly talk about the three technologies, the three neurotechnologies that the webinar is focused on. Then we're going to move into the panel questions, and then we're going to save the Q&A for the end. But you can still uh, put your, Q, your questions into the chat, and then we can answer them at the end. So feel free to put those in as the webinar progresses. All right, who are your speakers today? So luckily we have pictures because uh, the, <laughs> the video sharing is not working. Uh, so we have Tanya Lar Yardley. She's a physiotherapist and VP of Clinical Innovation at Health Tech Connects. And just to explain that a little bit, Health Tech Connects is the parent company of NeuroCatch. Under the Health Tech Connects umbrella is NeuroCatch, um, the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic, and then the Center for Neurology Studies. Tanya scans the globe for novel approaches and leads the integration of the clinical, technological, and research teams to ensure that advancements in treatment make it all the way to clients that can benefit, benefit from these innovations. Next, we have Zara. She is an occupational therapist with an undergrad in psychology and neuroscience and the program champion for neurofeedback at the Surrey Nut Neuroplasticity Clinic. She is passionate about all things brain health and has launched the neurofeedback program within the neuroplasticity clinic. And lastly, but not least, Matt is a kinesiologist and a clinical lead at the Neuroplasticity Clinic. He has advanced training in assessment and treatment of co complex vestibular conditions and treatments of concussion in sport. His passion is using validated technology in conjunction with accurate treatment to improve quality of life for those living with neurological conditions. So these are our speakers for today. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Tanya to, to talk a little bit about the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. Thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, it's um, in my 31 years of being a physio, I have never worked in such an amazing work environment uh, that is just filled with really passionate clinicians who are not only passionate about patient care, but also about advancing the standard of care uh, for people with brain injuries and people who want to function with higher performing brains. So it's an interdisciplinary clinic. We have lots of different people working together, physio, kin, occupational therapy, clinical counseling. We have medical support, psychological support, speech and language pathologists who visit. Um, uh, we've had massage come in and out at different times. So the clinic really morphs to support the types of cl clients that we are seeing at any given time. So we have a lot of different people that come on and off of the team, depending on what is needed. We treat a variety of different condi conditions, um, concussions, stroke, brain injuries, Parkinson's, MS, chronic pain, and a whole host of different kinds of movement disorders. We are actually known for seeing the people that have seen everyone else unsuccessfully and are stuck and one of the things that we're most proud of is helping people get off of that plateau and improving again, Some teams, sometimes even as long as 15 or 20 years after their initial incident. We also have a performance division. So we've been working a lot with amateur and pro athletes and teams globally uh, to enhance cognitive performance in the context of sports. So that's been a really fun thing to do as well, traveling around the world, scanning teams and uh, talking to them about improving their mental edge in the game. Well, that's really kind of the heart of it and uh, looking forward to hosting any questions that you have later on. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, I'm going to move on to the technology slide. So today we're going to talk about NeuroCatch, Pawns, and MindLift. So I'm going to have each one of the speakers uh, talk about each one of these technologies. So Tanya, you can start with, uh, with NeuroCatch. Sure, I'm happy to. NeuroCatch is a, a mobile EEG. As you can see, it looks a little bit like a swim cap. <laughs> 
and it actually is completely mobile. It comes in a very small briefcase that we can take anywhere. So it, it goes anywhere that a clinician needs to go, which takes kind of the whole idea of having a brain lab and transports it to anywhere that you need to be at any time. It provides a benchmark of cognitive functioning and the test itself is just over six minutes long. It uses EEG to measure three main indicators of cognitive function. The first one is kind of your sensory awareness. The second part is really your ability to attend and put things into context, so your basic attention. And then the third thing is your cognitive processing speed, which in a sport context or in a life context is crucially important for preventing a fall or preventing a hit or getting out of the way of something coming your direction. So it's uh, it's been really fascinating and it uses sound. So it also looks at you know cognitive processing of, of word pairs and our ability to discriminate sounds and things. And there's a lot of reasons why we use sound instead of visual. And certainly we can cover that when we get into the Q&A part. And we use it in a million different contexts. So, you know, we use it for TBI and dementia. I use it with my long COVID patients. Uh, we use it in sports performance. Uh, there are lots of different ways of using this. We also have teams of people that are using it with kids with learning disabilities. Uh, some of the hospitals like Alberta Children's Hospital are using it to in the pediatric ICU to looking at consciousness. So there's a lot of potential applications of NeuroCatch. Basically, anything that affects your brain uh, can be measured. And so it helps to also um, support in looking at different diagnostic things. So it's a part of a battery of tests. And we also use it to monitor treatment and see what's working and not working. I think that pretty much covers it. Excellent. Thank you. And Matt, did you want to talk about PONS? Yeah, for sure. Um, so PONS stands for Portable Neuromodulation Stimulator. Uh, it's one of the treatment interventions that we offer at our clinic. Um, you can see that it's comp comprised of two components there. Um, the mouthpiece with the electrodes at the bottom is actually making contact with the tongue. Um, it stimulates two cranial nerves, five and seven, so facial and trigeminal nerves, uh, and our clients are wearing this during intensive rehabilitation. Um, essentially, it creates a physiological response um, through the stimulation to help facilitate neuroplastic change. Um, in Canada, it's a class two medical device, um, and it's authorized for the treatment currently of stroke, MS, and mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, um, and those suffering from chronic balance and gait deficits. Excellent. Thank you. And Sarah, would you like to talk about MindLift? Yeah, for sure. So MindLift is a type of neurofeedback. Um, neurofeedback is part of the biofeedback family, um, except we're getting feedback from the brain. So the idea with neurofeedback is that we have this device that we put on clients' brains. It reads their brain waves in real time and feeds back to them on a screen, whether it's in an optimal state or not. Um, and that is using intermittent reinforcement when it's in an optimal state, they get more points in a game on the screen. And it basically trains the, the brain to be in that state more. Um, so it has a lot of really amazing clinical applications. Um, it's been studied the longest for ADHD. Uh, it's also really good for anxiety, depression, PTSD, cognitive enhancement. We use it in um, like performance optimization. So even for people who maybe don't have uh, a disorder or something going on in their brain, they can use it just to, in, you know, improve their focus in general or improve their creativity. Um, and it can be a very, very useful tool for helping clients figure out how to self-regulate over time. Thank you for that. So there, there's really a nice, uh, you know, there's nice synergies between these three different neurotechnologies. And I know that recently there was a, a Frontiers paper published that used NeuroCatch as a primary outcome measure for cognition when looking at PONS and, and PT uh, in combination. So maybe one day we can do something, NeuroCatch can do something with MindLift as well. All right, so now that we have the speakers covered, we talked about the technologies, let's jump into the fun part. This, these are the panel questions. So the first question is, how did you decide to adopt these specific technologies? Of course, there's a ton of different uh, neurotech, just technologies in general that are available to different clinics. So I'd love to hear your opinion um, and really kind of what brought you to adopt these specific ones. Tana, did you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I think in our clinic, we are looking for anything that is easy to administer for clinicians 
uh, intuitive for clients in terms of the information that it feeds back and gets gives maximal benefit. So all three of these technologies had good data and science behind them. They were all relatively straightforward to administer, so it didn't increase the burden on clinicians. And they were all, uh, you know, scientifically validated to actually improve the outcome. So I would say, you know, those are some of the criteria that we look at. Certainly, um, it's it's a barrier with some neurotechnologies that the cost or the cumbersomeness of use or the, you know, the confounding variables to clients who don't necessarily understand technology. So we're always looking for things that are simple, intuitive, and impactful. Thank you. And just a question. Did you put together a business case when you were adopting these technologies? Always. <laughs> yeah. And ironically, one of the roles that I have with the company now is actually helping other clinics through the Brain Innovation Network to decide, you know, what technologies best fit their clinical practice, how they can build a business case around them, and then supporting them through that whole business plan to make sure that the impact is delivered both to the clinicians using it and the patients that they're serving. Thank you. And That's also great. the business, ultimately, I guess, in the end, it has to make sense financially, too. Absolutely. Sarah, did you have anything to add uh, to what Tanya just said? Um, yeah. So one of the reasons why we decided to add the neurofeedback specifically into the clinic is because in these populations, we see it, like Tanya mentioned earlier, there can be these plateaus that people have, or people have gone to a bunch of different clinics and they're not getting better. And these technologies actually offer us this really unique opportunity to, to work with the brain on the level of the brain, rather than um, using external things to work with the brain. We're actually physically changing the chemistry and the function of the brain. Um, and that can make such a big difference when people are plateauing or having these, these struggles with rehab. And since implementing these technologies, I've definitely seen a huge change um, between NeuroCouchPons and BindLift um, with how much people are recovering. And that's really at the heart of what we do at our clinic is, is we really want to help people get better and help people gain their function back. So this has given us that um, ability. And that was a big reason why we decided to adopt them. Thank you. And Matt, did you want to finish off this panel question? Yeah, for sure. The, um, they already mentioned some great points, but yeah, for, for me, you know, working mostly client facing, um, you know, you really start to identify the areas of need. And I think that, you know, when we're, when we're having underserviced populations specifically, you know, our mild to moderate traumatic brain injury populations, um, there's not a lot out there uh, in terms of treatment options outside of traditional PT um, that are scientifically validated. Uh, and so when they have the opportunity to you know, facilitate bringing in the PONS device into our clinic and seeing, you know, some of the life-changing um, differences that we could make in people that had lost a lot of hope. Um, it was it was a no-brainer for me to, you know, bring it in to improve our, our patient care. Um, having something like the NeuroCatch also to measure and objectively measure um, the treatment outcomes and help you navigate through um, your programming uh, is also for us, uh, uh, really important in terms of being able to treat and, um, you know, you can't really treat what you can't assess. So having something objective um, that's measuring physiological um, changes, um, like Zara said, at the brain level uh, was really important for us. Um, and then, you know, bringing something in like the mind lift to actually change that um, um, and have lasting effects uh, for us uh, is what we're looking for when we're bringing in a specific technology from the clinical side. Yeah, it, thanks for that. I, and, and I would agree. I think that we're at such an exciting time where neuroscience has come so far and we're building that bridge between what's been kind of buried in research and making it, you know, clinically accessible to, to practitioners like yourselves. So it's definitely an exciting time for, for neurotechnologies. All right, moving on to question number two. Obviously, neurotechnologies are, you know, technically dis disruptive technologies, so there's usually a learning curve. So could you, uh, each of you kind of talk about the different learning curves that you've experienced with adopting new technologies, and how did you overcome these, these learning curves, and what challenges are you facing? And I guess we, Zara, do you want to start? 
Yeah, for sure. So the learning curve for neurofeedback, I'll be honest, is pretty steep. <laughs> um, it is, there's a lot of neuroanatomy and um, neurophysiology to understand and understanding um, the frequencies in the brain and how they, they impact different things and how different disorders might impact those frequencies. There's just a lot to know. And it takes quite a bit of um, knowledge and then also instruction and, and guidance from other clinicians who've been doing it for a long time. Um, and this is where the Brain Innovation Network that Tanya mentioned comes in, because while it might not be the easiest technology to adopt into your clinic, um, it we have a very established program at our clinic, and it can be a really wonderful referral network for those clients who are struggling. Um, so, I mean, we did overcome it by by many years of trial and error and learning and um, and seeking that knowledge out, but um, a huge part of what we want to do now is really expand that referral network and cross refer and make sure that the clients that other clinics have that might be struggling, get the opportunity to use this awesome technology as well. Thanks for that. And Tana, did you want to go next? Yeah, actually, I would just like to build on what Zara said. One of the things that we love to be able to do is actually collaborate and work in collaboration with clinics basically all over the world. So our team members become your team members in that we're coaching, supporting, uh, helping clients. One of the things that Zara didn't mention and one of the reasons that we also adopted the MindLift um neurofeedback is it's something that clients can use at home outside of the clinic. So we've had clinics contact us from all over saying, you know, we don't know how to do neurofeedback, but we really think our client would benefit. And we are actually in a situation where we can mail the information out to the clinic or the, um, the actual equipment out to the clinic and then do a virtual consultation with potentially the client and their therapist together and do some coaching so that the client can do that neurofeedback work between their rehab sessions and, and potentially get off of a plateau and benefit further from the rehab they're already doing with their existing community team supported by our team. So, you know, we found creative ways to, you know, to allow our clinicians to be your clinicians for those tough clients. Uh, so that's been really good. And, and I would say too, that, um, the same with the ponds. The ponds can be done in community as well. We can support people outside of our clinic to be able to have it in their home community. So part of our overriding mission is to create access for people to technologies that they would normally never see and uh, and have access to and to support clinicians and learning the skills needed to support those people in their community. So that's a that's a really big factor. And the other thing that's interesting. Uh, with regard to what Matt was saying too about the whole idea of it being objective versus subjective because it's actually measuring what's going on physiologically and structurally in your brain most of these technologies actually can be paired with a panel of your traditional battery of tests but add another objective measure to either validate what you're seeing or to challenge it and say okay so you know we thought this was working and clients think that they're improving, but they're not really sure sometimes. So what I love about NeuroCatch and some of the other technologies is you can say, this is what's happening functionally, and this is what's happening structurally, and pair those two things together. That's great. Thank you. And Matt, did you want to finish this one off? Anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, just building off what they said there. I mean, I think the biggest learning curve um, with any new technology um, is that if it's new and novel and disruptive, um, you know, you're going to get patient inquiries that, you know, are, are thinking that this is a magic pill. And so part of the navigation is really sitting down and having, you know, setting, setting expectations with your client in terms of what this technology is going to offer and, and really, you know, making them understand why this is something that they would benefit from. So I think that that's the first and foremost kind of challenge that you, you need to navigate as a clinic is making sure that you really have a strong why and purpose for bringing something in. Um, and in the case of, of NeuroCatch, um, you know, it just made sense in terms of our workflow. Uh, we, we, we handle a large volume of concussion clients um, every day. Um, and like I was saying at first, it's, it's, a, it's a population that is still very much based on clinical diagnoses. There's not a lot of objective measures for it. So um, finding a way for NeuroCatch to fit in um, was also you know, part of the learning curve, but because of how easy it was to um, implement, um, it, it, I found that it was something that really easily fit into our workflow in terms of the assessment and treatment um, kind of processes that we already have. 
Um, and then, you know, in terms of, of challenges that clients face, I think the biggest thing is just making sure as a clinic that the, the primary st uh, stakeholders in, in your client's um, recovery or care team are, are knowledgeable on these sorts of things. Um, you know, whenever you're bringing in something new and disruptive, um, it's, it's not always the case that, you know, primary care physicians or other healthcare professionals are aware of these options. So oftentimes we're getting people that would have benefited from this long a long time ago um, that have only really heard about us through their own research. So I would say that that's a big challenge that clients face. And that's something as a clinic that we're working on, um, you know, trying to reduce the amount of barriers it takes for clients to find you and get access to these kinds of treatments. Thank you. All right, moving on to question three. My favorite question, <laughs> how has your practice changed as a result of having NeuroCatch and how has it in enhanced patient care? And if you could provide um, a, like a real world example, that would be really helpful too. And Tana, did you wanna start this one off? Sure, actually, this one is one that's pretty dear to my heart because coming in, I had absolutely zero EEG experience. I just thought that it was a technology that was beyond my capability and you know, I would never understand. And it's funny that, you know, after a couple of years of actually using the neural catch, it's something that I use in my clinical practice almost every day. Uh, and, and it's really made a difference for me because things like brain fog and cognitive symptoms are influenced by such a host of different factors, you know, from poor sleep to being dehydrated to, you know, stress and all kinds of other things. So sometimes when someone's coming in with cognitive symptoms, it's really hard to wade through what the root of it is. And so my um, clinical caseload over the last uh, year and a half has actually been long COVID clients. And I've been doing a, a group uh, and studying outcomes on, on that particular group. And we had one lady who was in the program and, you know, was getting closer to a return to work phase. And she was really, she came in one day and she was like, oh, you know, my cognitive symptoms are, are worsening. I think that, you know, I'm not getting better and I'm concerned. And it was really interesting. So we had been doing uh, some cog training. So I pulled up her training logs and we looked at how she was uh, compared to her age and gender. And she had gone from 76% of, you know, the average for her age and gender to 94%. She had improved tremendously there. And then we did her neural catch scan to validate and her cognitive processing speed was better. Her amplitudes were, you know, right where they should be and everything had improved there as well. And as it turned out, she was having a tremendous amount of stress at home. So rather than, you know, hammering on more cognitive training and, you know, and making the assumption that her brain wasn't healing, we figured out the stress was the root of the problem. We treated the stress and the cognitive symptoms resolved. So for me, we could have gone for months and months thinking that, you know, the interventions we were doing weren't working. And in fact, it actually uh, helped to reassure her that her brain was healing and that her cognition was improving. And that shifted her whole attitude. It was, it was night and day after doing those two uh, things hand in hand. So we could look at the structural and functional integrity of the brain and reassure her. And then, you know, she was off to the races. Same thing with athletes. Sometimes we get someone who's out with a concussion and it's their fear that's holding them. It's not, a, you know, a, a a healing problem related to their brain. So when we look at this battery of tests that we do, and we cross reference the objective and subjective findings, sometimes that reassurance is enough to move things forward in a really positive way. No, that's a, that's a really great story. Um, and Matt, I know that you have experience with NeuroCatch as well. So did you uh, want to talk a little bit about how your, your practice, the practice has changed and how you're enhancing patient care? Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's really helped me in terms of being more accurate and and more efficient in terms of my treatment interventions. Um, you know, with with anything that provides you with a clearer image, you're going to be able to actually get to the root of the problem. Um, like Tanya mentioned, uh, in athletes, you know, there's specific things that that NeuroCatch tells you in terms of how their brain is is actually functioning, and you know. If you're if you're not accurate in terms of of where you're actually putting your resources while the client is with you in treatment, um, you know you might be prolonging the the actual time that it takes for them to recover. Um, I find that it's also great for people that may have 
um, less understanding of what's going on to them and, and have a high level of anxiety to have that reassurance of, of an objective measure that you know, hey, they're actually trending in the right direction um, and helps build rapport as a clinician and then helps develop trust um, in terms of, you know, what you're telling them to do and buy in, which is really important in the field of work that we do. Um, so in terms of enhancing patient care, I would really say I've noticed a big difference in terms of the efficiency and um, accelerating recovery um, because you're able to really focus on the root causes of why people might be suffering with the symptoms that they're having. Thank you for that. And uh, I'll lead into question four. This is a similar question, but it's going to be directed for Sarah. Um, with re regards to neurofeedback, how has the practice changed and how has it enhanced patient care? And uh, a story would be great. Yeah, definitely. I think similarly to neuro, neuro catch, when we have this objective measure of the brain, there's a validation of invisible symptoms. So I've had quite a few clients with, you know, post-concussion syndrome or um, long COVID, which are these things that you can't really see from the outside. So a lot of times people don't understand what they're going through or their friends and family can't see it and understand it. And having this really objective measure of the brain and what's happening in the brain. I mean, I've had clients literally start crying when they look at the assessment because they're like, this finally says, you know, that there is something wrong and I'm not just making it up and it's not just all in my head. Like, you know, um, they're able to actually see this and that's provides a lot of validation. And then from there, we have so much therapeutic growth that can happen when somebody feels validated. So that's a really huge part of it. Um, another thing is that like we were talking about before with those clients who are stuck, um, I had a client with post-concussion syndrome who had been in almost a catatonic state for years. Like she had a very, very hard time doing any of her activities of daily living um, and could not really engage in the techniques that we wanted her to engage in with physio or occupational therapy because um, she was just so symptomatic. Um, and after a few months of doing neurofeedback, her brain really got to a point where she was able to engage in therapy and has seen an incredible amount of gains. There's There was nothing else that we did in the year of therapy prior to introducing neurofeedback that even touched as much growth as she got with that. So it's really just seeing that how much more growth is possible when we implement these technologies with the neurocatch and the pawns and MindLift. I've seen very similar sort of things where, you know, someone who's really struggling can get results. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, and just to kind of set expectations, we have about two more panel questions, and then we're going to open the floor to more general questions. But uh, I know that Balraj and Tanya have been answering them in the chat as well. All right, question five, this is going to be about pawns. So this is really directed at, at Matt and Zara, unless Tanya, of course, you can chime in if you have uh, any comments. But what are some of the ways that practice has changed as a result of having pawns? How has it enhanced patient care? And again, I, I always like to hear the, the real world stories. So Matt, did you want to start? Yeah, for sure. I, and I think the beautiful thing about bringing a technology in like the pawns is that you know, at its core, it's still relying on your on your clinical judgment. And so, you know, in terms of what what things I've changed in terms of my practice is that it's just basically taking what I do with clients and elevated it to a new level in terms of the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, you know, I think a great patient story that we can share and, and then it stems off of what what Zara was saying was, you know, in the world of concussion or traumatic brain injury. Um, it's not, it's, we call it an invisible injury because it's, it's hard for people that are not in it to really understand the level of, of um, function that is lost. And um, people seek us after being told for a long, long time that this is going to be the best that they're ever going to get and they're going to have to accept and live with it. And uh, I remember vividly one of the first clients that I've ever worked with um, was a lady that lived on Vancouver Island. And for her, um, she came in basically you know, it's been three, four years since her injury and she, she couldn't walk, um, you know, in a straight line. And, and she had a lot of thoughts and doubts about, is this an all in my head? Cause she had been told this, she was super emotional, um, you know, just completely dysregulated in terms of what she can do. And so she had no, she had lost so much in terms of what her life was. Uh, she wasn't able to work, um, couldn't drive, couldn't even stay behind a steering wheel in her car. 
Um, and and so with the pawns, obviously we 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 worked on you know one validating what she's going through and making her understand that this is a very real thing that she's going through. Um, but by the end of the first two weeks of treatment, uh, you know, she was actually engaging in her driving rehabilitation again, um, doing, you know, small loops around um, her, her house um, and, and her gait had significantly improved to the point where she no longer felt like she needed to stay inside and not go to public areas. Um, you know, getting a sense of herself back. Uh, and, and then at the end of the 14 weeks, um, you know, adhering to the program and really buying into the process, um, she had sent me, she had stopped on the side of the road after crossing um, a highway bridge for the first time in years. Uh, and she had just sent me a photo of her on the other side in tears of joy saying, you know, hey, I did it. Like, I finally am able to you know, visit my kids on the other side of, of the highway. I can actually visit my grandkids. Um, and so that for me was was extremely powerful in terms of, you know, how someone that had been technically told that they had been plateaued or they're ne never going to get any better, um, that a way that a technology like this um, can help people, you know, push past um, what, what initially might have been their thought of, um, I'm not going to get any better than this. So, being able to elevate what we do um, and, and, and support and really, you know, take into account that the brain is always changing and we can, we can use that neuroplastic change to restore function. Thank you. And Zara, did you want to add anything to what Matt just said? Yeah, just building off that neuroplasticity statement that he said at the end, you know, many years ago, we didn't even know that it, the brain could still change. Um, after a certain point, we thought that, you know, just in, in childhood was the brain developing. And now in recent years, we've realized that neuroplasticity goes on our entire lives. And now this technology gives us this access to enhance the neuroplasticity of our brain. Um, and it, it's it's great because it's not exactly passive, right? You don't just sit there and you and put the device on and you get better. You are doing training with it. So there's a lot of that like internal locus of control of the client really taking um, onus for their their health and their change. And that's a really important part of rehab, as we all know. Um, and also we see these very miraculous changes when neuroplasticity is involved. Um, another story, we had a client with um, pretty severe um, mercury poisoning, um, who had been trying many, many, many different treatments for years. Um, and when he came to the clinic, he had a difficulty walking down the hallway in a straight line. Um, by the end of, I think, I don't know if he did one or two courses of treatment, but by the end, he had actually, this is a very, <laughs> um, you know, a very grandiose example, but he ended up hiking in the Himalayas and doing part of Everest. Um, and sent us many videos and photos of him at the top of these amazing, incredible mountains. And that really touched my heart in a very special way because, you know, this was a person who couldn't walk down a hallway and then he ended up doing Everest, which is one of the most challenging mountains in the world. So not not every day do we get like those amazing stories, but um, that was a very special moment for our clinic for sure because of the ponds. That, that was a great story. Do you mind, Victoria, if I add one more? Please, yeah. I know that Matt and Sarah are very humble, but there's one that kind of speaks to, to the ROI on adding neurotechnologies because a lot of clinics are concerned about the cost. And uh, we did a, a really unique project that's just winding up right now. The results are hopefully going to be put out in a white paper fairly soon. Uh, we partnered with a big national insurer and they gave us uh, nine of their people that were uh, TBI related. They were all that the minimum had to be two years post injury and they had to have gone through what they call the change of definition, which means that they are deemed permanently disabled and unemployable. So um, they had nothing to lose because these people were already um, going to be pensioned for the rest of their lives. Um, some of them were years and years and years post injury. All of them had, a, you know, quite severe symptoms. Some of them had POTS and vestibular problems, vestibular migraines, uh, and a whole host of other kind of comorbidities. So it was really the toughest of the toughest cases. And we just celebrated because last month, the fifth of the nine had crossed the six months of durable full return to work. <laughs> and so um, we looked at the uh, 
actual outcomes from a financial standpoint, and they're estimating that we saved that insurance company close to $2.7 million in uh, payments. And we have five extraordinarily happy and grateful patients that got their life back. So uh, it's really interesting because more and more and more, those insurers are starting to look at the outcomes of these neurotechnologies and actually consider funding these things because of the um, dramatic impact that we've had on getting people off of those treatment plateaus. So um, if, if cost is a barrier, there are ways that we can help you kind of figure out the financial implications of the work that you're doing and, and be able to pitch to some of these insurers to get some of these technologies covered. Absolutely. I, I think you're right. I mean, ultimately, it's about improving patient care, improving the, the lives of, of patients. So usually you can end up making the money working with insurance companies. They are realizing uh, the benefits of, of really preventive medicine and, you know, helping patients get better faster. All right, moving on to the last question, the last panel question. Uh, and this is probably why a lot of people are, are here on this webinar, but um, how do you build a business case around novel neurotechnologies? And what advice would you give to others wanting to dive into these tech innovations? Uh, Tanya, you can you can start. I think I probably answered the first question a little bit already mm -hmm. with my last yes, comment. I got ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> but really, it's looking at your community and the needs of your community, looking for areas where there are, you know, tough and sometimes what seem like intractable problems for um, patients and also the funders who, um, you know, support them in terms of benefits administration sometimes, and really looking at the longer term vision and what it's gonna cost uh, to keep somebody off of work or keep someone in a disabled state and, and making the contrast and often the cost of the therapy compared to the cost of the long-term impact financially, uh, both to the person and to the insurer can be a really smart way to approach it. So looking at the bigger picture rather than just looking at the individual condition and the short term that we have them for, but looking at the, the lifetime impact of these kinds of uh, difficult conditions to treat. And Thank also, you. as as Brainovation partner, we also work with our clients to help them figure out business cases. So, you know, we have a variety of different kinds of clients uh, using it in different contexts. So I'm working with one group on how to approach the seniors' homes about getting a neuro catch assessment as part of the annual assessment of residents when they're doing, you know, fall uh, assessment, risk assessments and things like that, and how PONS might potentially help with some of these fall risk clients or how neurofeedback might help with some of these early dementia folks and, and helping them self-regulate. So there's lots of different forums and formats, but typically as someone with a business background, I'm happy to sit down with our customers and help them figure out a path forward. Yeah. And just to build on that, I know from, you know, the NeuroCatch perspective is a lot of clients are building NeuroCatch into um, kind of like a total brain wellness program. So it's not just kind of one-off scans um, or just doing them, you know, um, on the house kind of, kind of thing, but building it into a bigger program to kind of offset the costs. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add about building a business case around neurotechnologies? Yeah. Um, and I think, I think you nailed it. There is, um, you know, finding ways to build programs for us here and, and implementing these neural techs into, into programs um, has been a, a really good way for us to generate revenue for a clinic and, and make sure that these technologies are, are helping pay for themselves. Um, you know, an example that I could use is at our clinic, we've, we've actually bundled neural catch into something called the brain and body performance optimization program. Uh, which looks at optimizing cognitive function. Um, so it just so happens that, you know, we're, we're, we're fulfilling a need in, like Tanya was mentioning, noticing your needs um, in the community is, is, is a lot of people in sport are, are very, very driven towards the physical optimization piece. And that's a very saturated market. So looking at something that can actually work on the cognitive piece and the co competitive edge that comes along with that in sport was something that was really interesting to me. Um, and so it just made sense for us to use, you know, a readily, easily to you easily implementable technology like the neural catch um, to have a battery of benchmarking assessments for, for players that are in contact sports um, to improve player safety and improve player performance. 
uh, for me, it was a very easy business case to make. And it's something that our stakeholders around um, our clinic are very, very interested in um, and has had really, really good connections made out of there um, that drives not only our assessment batteries, but also people coming in for treatment. Um, so yeah, that would be a really good way for, for a clinic to build a business cases, to lump it into programs um, that you can offer. Absolutely. And lastly, Sarah, did you have anything that you'd like to add? I think they covered it really well. I think it's also just about what the clinicians um, and the, the team leads at your clinic are really interested in because these technologies are really amazing in the, in the way that they can be used for so many different things. So really, if you have an area of interest in anything related to brain and physical health, you can probably find a way to integrate this technology into it. Um, and that's that's really cool and exciting for, for pretty much anyone in any clinic because you can find a way to integrate it if you want to. Um, and that can really build your, your clientele and that can build your, your, your programs to be so much more robust and have these like great scientifically validated um, technologies. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great point about finding, you know, brain health champions within your clinic and just getting, I think, overall staff buy-in is also uh, a really important piece of that. All right, so that concludes our panel questions. So now I'm going to open the floor uh, to any questions. So you can either raise your hand and you can uh, talk uh, and my, my colleague Balraj will unmute you. Uh, or if you don't wanna talk, you can just type it into the chat. Uh, while you're typing your questions or raising your hands, I just want to say thank you so much to Tanya, Zara, and Matt for joining us this afternoon and um, you know doing a, a deep dive into neurotechnologies. It's really great to hear firsthand experience from seasoned leaders like yourselves um, that are really kind of embedded on the, the ground floor at a, a neuroplasticity clinic. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Very well, much. You're yeah. very welcome. <laughs> and Paul, and I also did you just to... wanted to Sorry. open up that if anyone does want to reach out to us uh, privately too, we're happy to share email addresses and answer any more specific questions that you have that you may or may not be comfortable, you know, doing in the group format. Yeah, that's a good point. If you want to put your email in the in the chat, Tanya, that would be great. Or if Paul, you want sure. to add that in. Um, but if there are no questions, um, I'll just give it a few more minutes. We can uh, we can end this webinar. It is being recorded, so we are going to send up uh, send out a follow up email if you want to you know watch it again if you think you missed anything. And if you are interested in joining our Brainovation Network, you can reach out to Tanya for that. I believe, right, Tanya? Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions related to the network. All right, Balraj, is there any questions? If not, oh yeah, oh, we have I a question see. from Maria. Uh, Maria, I just unmuted you. Uh, hello, um, this isn't Maria. I'm actually her son, Chris. But we're sitting <laughs> together to you guys over from uh, in Yorkshire, in England. Um, we work a lot within concussions and sport and uh, all that stuff. But we would be really uh, excited to work with you guys, or you know, alongside you guys, and uh, understand your methods um we are from back we're in the background of uh, neurotherapy uh qeg baselining heads and um recovering through neurotherapy and photobiomodulation so i think uh, uh I, I i personally would really like to have a chat with you guys at some point and uh uh yeah figure something out or just have a chat and pick your brain <laughs> That would be wonderful. And, and actually, um, we're always open to learning about new technologies as well. So one of the things that I didn't say in the, in the course of the webinar is that our uh, Center for Neurology Studies, which is actually embedded inside of our clinic, uh, studies all different kinds of neurotechnology. So in any given year, we probably have eight or 10 clinical trials going on on all kinds of things. So this was only a tiny little teaser of some of the uh, information that we've gathered about different tech and different treatment approaches. So, you know, our clinical trials division is working on photo biomodulation. We look at other forms of um, spinal cord stimulation. We're doing psychedelic assisted therapy research. We're doing anything neuroplasticity or brain health related. Uh, we're doing some uh, pharma trials for migraine meds. 
So there's uh, this is like the tiniest little taste. There's also a really cool technology that we've been using that's been extraordinarily helpful with um, self-regulation, and that's called ShiftWave. So I think it's shiftwave.co if you're interested in looking at that, which looks at vibration and the impact of vibration on the nervous system. And they actually have uh, discovered, you know, the frequencies of vibration that upregulate the nervous system. So if we have somebody coming in with depression or low motivation or apathy or catatonia or, you know, cognitive fatigue, we can use that to help kind of give them a neural boost. Uh, prior to doing brain training with them, or if we have somebody with PTSD or a super overregulated, you know, fight or flight kind of nervous system, we can actually ratchet their nervous system down to a point where, you know, on the fMRI that uh, they do in the testing phase of this, they actually found that it's similar to deep sleep and actually can promote the cerebral spinal fluid flush that happens with deep sleep. So we have access to other technologies and other, um, you know, kind of novel things that we've been playing with over the last little while. And so, you know, we could do another whole webinar on three or four more other things. <laughs> so if people are interested in learning more about some of the other technologies as well, we're happy to happy to share what we've learned. Oh, that, that's fantastic. This is actually Maria now. Um, and, and the reason our practice exists is because Chris suffered a very bad TBI. He was a professional cyclist. So we've been in the field for about 15 years. We work with a medical doctor and there's a team of us, which is fairly unusual for the UK because it is very much on the bleeding edge in the UK. Um, we don't really have a strong insurance industry. So everything is pretty much free on the point of contact in the UK because we have the NHS health system, um, but we are not supported by that. So we have a continual battle, the fact that we have to run a private clinic in the UK. Um, we've just undergone a large pilot study with cyclists around the world, looking at concussion and taking data. So that's very interesting as well. But our, our big goal is to get a suite of technologies together to get these guys rehabbed, mostly guys, I have to say that we end up seeing with that. But we also deal with stroke, chronic depression and anxiety, and we also do new neuromodulation, so TDCS and things like that as well. So there's an awful lot of sharing I think we could all do. Wonderful, wonderful. It's funny, our team was just out in the UK earlier this year and I'm hoping we'll be able to make another trip. Um, in the future. So if we do, we'll try to reach out to you directly and maybe even have a chance to meet in person someday. That that would be perfect because I think we're all after the same goal. We all have really the same cause. Yeah, agree. Yeah. So, and we're particularly interested because uh, although ERPs have been around for many years, I think it's about the database you use, especially for the athletes. Yeah. So, um, I think that's a, a slightly separate discussion. It would be really good to have because um, there's lots of different ways I know of taking the ERPs and we've got two different amplifiers that take them in different ways. But I am interested because the neurocatch system looks very simple. Um, sometimes they're not simple to take. Yeah, yeah. That's actually really um, valuable. And, and I actually love that you raised the point about how you measure and uh, one of the projects that we just finished, we're just writing it up right now, the results is we actually scanned the whole British Columbia Hockey League. So we have over 500 scans on hockey players. And we were we found some really interesting and novel findings about the differences between forwards, goalies and defensemen in terms of the, the way that their brain patterns work. And so now we're kind of crafting a specific database to hockey based on, you know, the, the preliminary findings from that. And we're hoping to build on that. So look Looking at where we also are embedded into rugby, MMA fighting. I think cycling sounds really interesting as well. So we can start over time to get some sport specific databases, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to sharing. How, how, how is the best way of doing that? Probably to reach out to me by email. I put my email in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out and then we can coordinate a time to, you know, if you formulate some questions that you have or you just want to connect and talk about the different work that our clinics are doing I'm happy to spend that time fantastic okay we will put our email in the chat and um we'll be in touch um because the insurance industry for instance in the UK is um this because it's not a regulated business in the UK either and the whole field of neuroplasticity 
they don't understand what's possible in terms of rehabilitation with it. So it is very much a education exercise for us. We can definitely help. Yeah, excellent. Lovely to meet you, Maria. Very nice to meet you too. I can't find your email anywhere. On oh, the, in the... I thought I posted it there, but maybe maybe it just went to the panelists. Huh, I'll try it again. And I can actually, so I have both of your emails. I can Great. connect you following this, uh, the webinar. I'll, I'll connect you directly. Thank oh, you. Much. No problem. Well, thank you again, everyone, for, for attending, and thanks to the speakers. Uh, I hope everyone has a great day, and again, feel free to reach out if you need to. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks thank so you. Much.